All right, let's go ahead and look uh, this evening at Psalm 119 briefly. Uh, we're looking forward to fellowship here together, but before uh, we go into the fellowship room and have the uh, cocoa and cookie part of the cocoa, cookies, and carols, uh, let's go ahead and look together at this very last section of Psalm 119. Now this is the uh, final sermon on, on Psalm 119. Uh, we've been working slowly but steadily through the psalm, and we've come to verse 169. And here we read, Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. Let your hand become my help, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live, and it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. And thus ends Psalm 119. And, of course, at the uh, conclusion of this psalm, we get the emphasis, uh, really, of the entire psalm. Uh, basically, when he says, I'm going astray like a lost sheep in this last final verse, he's demonstrating that even all through the scripture, all through Psalm 119, he's been devoted to the word of God. We, we point out the many synonyms for the Word of God within the psalm. So he has a, a profound devotion to God's Word, but at the same time he's acknowledging I'm helpless and I'm vulnerable and I don't know what to do. I'm like a sheep who has gone astray. Now, if you read the scriptures, you know that whenever it points out the idea of sheep going astray, it usually points out some kind of rebellion. Or, or some kind of sinfulness on our part. We have deviated from the way. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have gone our own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Well, part of that is in this psalm here, but we have to acknowledge the fact that the man that has gone astray here is a man that is devoted to God's word. And for him, going astray, and this too can be sin, right? But going astray for him is I'm helpless, I feel alone, I feel vulnerable. I, you know, you, you can tell people that and, and really, or somebody could say that to you and really a good reply might be, well, that's too bad, you, you don't have to feel that way. <laughs> because if you're a Christian, you really don't. Uh, you can ask the Lord to seek you and to find you and he will. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. So how can a man then, so devoted to the scriptures, so devoted to God's path for him, how can he be so much in need of the Lord's presence at this particular point, right at the end of the psalm? How can he feel lost? Well, I think it's the precarious situation that he's been in. And I don't think it's been resolved. And so... In this sense of helplessness and, and being forsaken or forgotten, or at least he feels that way, the outward condition of his life doesn't line up with the inward devotion that is there. Have you ever had that happen? I mean, you are resting in the promises of God. Everything interior-wise is going well, but then everything is crumbling around you. I think all of us have experienced that. And I think that that's what the psalmist is going through. He's exposed to his enemies. He feels like he's not being protected. He's wandering like a sheep away from God. And, and it's all because of this, what's happening to him. You say, well, that's not right. Well, it isn't. But that's how he feels. That's what he's going through. And the Psalms, a lot of them have to do with our emotions. And we are often governed by our emotions, like it or not. Um, so he has a confession. And that confession is in verse 176. He says, I have gone astray. That's a confession. 
That's an acknowledgement. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. You have to find me. I think that that's a good thing to say. You say, well, you know, why is this so important, acknowledging that he's gone astray, that, that there's sin in his own life, that he's struggling? Because this is what God commands us to do. This is what we should do. We should acknowledge that we have sin in our lives. Even the most godly among us, uh, whoever that would be, has sin in, in his or her life. And because of that, uh, we have to confess it. We have to acknowledge it. We have to say to God, yes, there is sin in me. Because if we, we say to him there is no sin, then we deceive ourselves and his truth is not in us. 1 John 1 and verse 8. But if we acknowledge the presence of sin in our lives, then 1 John 1, 9 tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But still, we always have to remember the balance of that that comes later in that epistle. Whoever abides in the Lord, whoever is, is living in accordance with his word and seeking him, whoever is doing that, they don't sin. 1 John 3, verse 6. You say, well, how is that possible? Well, he's born of God. And those who are born of God do not sin. You say, well, how can you be so dogmatic about that? Well, the Bible says that we do not sin. You say, well, how is that possible? It's possible because it says in that verse that his seed, that is the seed of the new creation, I am a new creature in Christ, that is remaining in me. And the new man that I am in Jesus Christ cannot sin because I've been born of God, 1 John 3, verse 9. So you take verse 6 and verse 9, you put them together. I've been born of God. I abide in Christ. Therefore, I cannot sin, at least in that new creature. And, and we cling to that truth. So the, the idea then to sin less is to put some focus on that new creation. That's what God would want us to do as we read through Psalm 119. Building up the new man, putting, putting on righteousness and putting off unrighteousness and doing that in the strength that God gives us. So I acknowledge the sin and the struggle that's in my life. I'm maintaining my position as a new creation or we could say as a child of God, a son or a daughter of God. But I also know that I've gone astray. So you come to that same conclusion that Paul came to in Romans 7, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's in nature. Well, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, he will deliver me. That's why there is no, now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And so we cry out just as the psalmist cried out, seek your servant. We are his servant. We are his child, uh, his children. So thankfully... The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, according to Luke 19 and verse 10. Jesus said, my, my sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me, and I give to them eternal life so that they shall never perish. That's great assurance. John chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. So as believers, what we want is the Lord to seek us out, to find us, and to do his good work in us, that he would work out that salvation, that he would do things within us that we can't do for ourselves. We need his help. We're vulnerable, just like the psalmist. That's what he's saying here. We seek the Lord because we know that from him, not from anyone else, but from him comes every good gift and every perfect gift. It descends from the Father of lights, and we look to him for it. So we desire that the Lord would seek us so that we might seek him and that we might receive direction and purpose in life. We call out to him for the direction that we need, and we do it because, here's the plea, I do not forget your commandments. That's the basis for it. The, the idea of his commandments, that's speaking about his word, I don't forget them. And so thankfully, we have this shepherd who seeks us, who hasn't forgotten us. You say, well, what do you mean forget? The idea of forgetting uh, has to do with um, not the legalistic, oh, I remember all of these things, and I can keep them all together. I think I got the wrong bullets under here. Uh, but it's not that that I'm concentrating on, but it's because that's legalism, right? If I've just got a laundry list in front of me, it's the cords of love that bind us to him. 
Those are the things that we're, we're talking about when we're remembering his word. Uh, Hosea tells us that we are destroyed for lack of knowledge, knowledge of his word. You say, well, that's Israel, but there's a, there's a parallel there for us. We need to hold on to the revelation of God because without it, we perish. We forget his words and we distance him from our lives. Now, with all of that said, let me just wrap up our, our time in Psalm 119 with some concluding thoughts that I think uh, will be helpful for us. All through Psalm 119, what do we witness? Well, we witness a man who is speaking directly to God about God. His focus is on God. You say, well, why is that important? You, we should be focusing on God. But, but what happens when we're suffering? What happens when we experience pain? What happens when we have conflict in our lives? Often, we don't turn to God, we turn inward. And that's what I think Psalm 119 has taught me, anyway. Uh, it's taught me that I struggle with both external and internal evil. And so because of that, I, I have to ask God for help over and over again. Lord, I need strength. Lord, I need help. Well, that is important because, you know, the psalmist asks the Lord for help almost 90 times in the psalm, in some way or another. He's asking the Lord for help. So how do we handle suffering? Well, number one, we need to ask God for help. We can't turn inward and start thinking about what's going on inside of us or what's happening to us. That inward preoccupation is exactly what we need to avoid because anytime you turn inward, that's where you're going to start to get depressed and feel despair in your life. Psalm 119 tells us, don't focus inward, focus on the Lord and on your relationship with Him. Uh, you say, well, what do you mean? Uh, well, think about what you're going through right now. I, I know that some of you deal with uh, struggles with your health, maybe you have daily headaches, maybe you have back problems, or maybe you're, you've got some ongoing injustice in your life and it's just there and it's not going away. Maybe it's anxiety about the future, maybe it's financial worries. Well, think about all of those things and, and then realize this, that because we are thinking about them, because they demand our attention, they're, they're causing us to turn away from God. Because we are fixated on those things, almost like what we're reading about with Goliath. We turn inward and at the same time turn away from God. And sometimes we even turn against God because of what's happening to us and against God's people. So our inward focus on suffering, what does it do? It blinds our eyes, it hardens our hearts, and it causes us to wander in this wilderness of self-pity. And we have to cry out to God, Lord, seek me and find me and put me straight. We complain, we become irritable instead of crying out to him. And when we do that, what we're doing is we're blotting out his name from our lives. We're moving God to the margins of our lives so that we can't hear him anymore. It's not that we're not his children. We are. It's just that we don't think he can help us. He's been quiet for so long. We can't hear his still small voice. Now, for those of us who have a quickened conscience, a very sensitive conscience, we look at it maybe from a different angle. What I mean by that is we face our own failures and we know it. We know that there's sin inside of us. We, we feel the regret. We feel the guilt. We always know that there's a sense of coming up short, but, the, but it's the same result, right? It's that inward focus. doesn't matter whether you're a rebel or or you're, you're playing the part of the martyr, it's still an inward focus and it's still leading out to the same place. It's why we are miserable instead of finding hope in God. People who are always involved in self-pity mumble their apologies to God, you know, and, and they really double their efforts and they say, Lord, I'm going to do right now. I'm going to, the future here, I've got the new year coming upon us. I'm going to start to do the things that I know that I should be doing. But still, that focus is there. And that's the problem. And we don't even know it. It's that inward focus. It's not a focus upon God or delighting on him. It's, it's more of a legalistic thing. And so the psalmist cried out at the beginning of the psalm, O oh Lord, do not utterly forsake me. 
And then he cries out at the end of the psalm, Seek your servant. So he understands helplessness and vulnerability. He's asking the Lord to not give up on him. Lord, don't abandon me. Find me. Uh, come after me and rescue me. His prayer is, all, and these are quotes from the psalm, don't let me wander from your commandments. I want to be close to you. Incline my heart to your testimonies. You ever feel like Bible reading becomes rote and dry? Well, the psalmist felt that way too. So he said, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law because there are wonderful things within the law of God. He understands the vanity of the world in which he lives. And so he prays, turn my eyes away from looking at vanity. Sin is powerful in his life. So he prays, don't let iniquity rule over me. He, he makes bad choices. So he prays and asks the Lord, Lord, make me. <laughs> he says that. Make me to walk in the path of your commandments. He needs daily mercy, so he asks that the Lord would be gracious to him according to the Lord's word. These are all phrases from Psalm 119. So let's just close with some statistics here. Ten times the psalmist in Psalm 119 asks, teach me. Nine times he asks the Lord to revive him. And six times he asks the Lord to make me understand. I think that we could take that from Psalm 119 and use it for prayer. In other words, we could pray, Lord, teach me this year. Revive me and make me understand your word. Because I don't forget it. Seek me. Let's pray together.